Good afternoon, good evening. I would like to welcome you to our fall lecture series. Um, so uh, for anyone that's not familiar with our program, we are the Applied Computer Science program. It's a hybrid art and technology degree that we focus on working with uh, emerging digital um, experiences. And so uh, our focus are interactive environments, uh, experiential design, and human interaction. And so for this lecture series, we have decided to, to focus on, on the role that computer science has within um, creative industries. And we have invited several creative technologists to join us. And so for tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce Venas Farahi who, she's a designer and a creative technologist based in Los Angeles, working at the intersection of fashion, architecture, and interaction design. Trained as an architect and specializing in 3D printing and physical computing, her ultimate goal is to enhance the relationship between the human beings and their environment by following morphological and behavioral practices inspired by natural systems. Venaz is a recipient of a number of prestigious awards, including the 2016 World Technology Design Award and the 2016 Innovation by Design Fast Company Design Award. She is currently an Annenberg Fellow, and she's completing her PhD in Interdisciplinary Media Arts and Practice at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. So after Venaz's lecture, we will have some time for Q&As. And, and so, so, yes, please um, help me welcome Venas Farahi. Oh. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for the introduction. And um, both Anna and Biana are my dear friends, so it's very a pleasure for me to be here. Also, this is my first time coming to uh, Woodbury campus, and I have to say it's really kind of impressive in its own way, so uh, it's very exciting to be here. Um, so as Anna mentioned, I come from, and I kind of feel like I don't want to stand there, so I'm going to stand here. Uh, so I come from the world of uh, architecture. I've trained as an architect, and then I started doing my PhD in media arts and practices at the School of Cinematic Arts. So today I want to uh, share some of my work um, uh, in the intersection of fashion, architecture, design, and technology in general, and how I'm basically exploring what is the relationship of human body with interactive environments, ranging from the scale of human body and all the way to the scale of architecture. Um, so um, in this type of work is really looking at variety of uh, technologies available um, from various sensory technologies that you can implement into material and in, particularly in design to really explore what is the future of uh, built environments. Um, and uh, really the application in my case it was fashion and architecture but you can apply these ideas in any scales in between as well including furniture design. Um, and as, as technology and sensors, I think one of the reasons that I got really excited about this is that we're already living in environments that they're populated with a lot of sensors. You just enter to a bathroom and there is like sensors that detect your presence. Uh, to, to buildings that it just reads what's your, what, what is your gestures or, or even the voices that you make. Uh, so for me as a designer, or I think for all of us as creative technologists, it's very important to think about what we can design with these type of systems and how we can rethink uh, the sort of form and narratives uh, that we can do with this type of um, um, systems. Um, I started experimenting um, with these ideas, uh, particularly looking at soft, uh, reconfigurable, uh, materials, materials that they can change their shape, uh, their colors, and they respond to their environment. Um, and most of the time, um, this can borrow a, a lot from various disciplines, including soft robotics and um, material science, and really explore those ideas in a different uh, scales. Uh, the main inspiration in this type of inv investigation really come from the world of nature. 
uh, both in terms of its morphology, but also in terms of its behavior in both responding to internal as well as, as, well as external stimuli, which is really fascinating. So for me, um, it's very, very interesting that how I can understand the underlying uh, principles behind the, this type of dynamic responses uh, and creates um, objects that they have almost just primitive intelligence in responding to those uh, stimuli. Um, in my PhD research, um, I'm trying to kind of come up with interesting way to, to frame uh, for this type of interaction, which we, which we call it embodied, em, embodied emotional uh, inter interaction, which is less about uh, you press a button, something, uh, a task has been done, but more to create sort of empathetic relationship or different type of relationship between users and that of uh, built environments. Um, so today I'm going to take you through this journey that how I do this type of work. Um, it really has to do with two interconnected activities. One is how I develop uh, materials, how to use uh, uh, the knowledge of design we have using computational system to design new materials that they, uh, they, they have a different type of properties using variety of uh, 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 systems such as 3D printing or digital fabrication as an overall umbrella. And then secondly, uh, basically implementation of robotic technology using sensory technology or actuation system and microcontrollers. And along with new material system, I developed this type of uh, interact interactive systems. So I'll walk you through this. Uh, but um, very first I started, um, I graduated from architecture, I started building more architectural installation by creating series of walls that they respond to the user's uh, input. In this case, um, kind of walls that respond to your hand movement, so you can control the movements of uh, the, the, the built environments or the wall uh, with your hand movement. In this case, um, I use a leap motion uh, that it can track your hands movement that it can track your hand movement and, and use series of libraries such as swiping dragging uh, tapping on different parts and remotely you can sculpt the form of the environments um, this was uh, this was um, one of the idea that basically thinking about how we communicate with one another using our hand gestures um, but also we use our hand gestures for various communication purposes for our devices. I mean, now two years old uh, kid, they know how to uh, interact with an with a, with a iPad or an iPhone. So it was very interesting to see how we can apply the same type of principle but remotely change the shape of uh, the built environments. But mm, let me go back to this um, project. This project had one problem for me, and that was the fact that I had to always, when we were exhibiting this piece, people were coming in the space, they had to stand in one location and interact with the, with the, with the surface of the wall. But what was interesting for me, it wasn't just you we move in the space in a three-dimensional space. So it's not about just standing in one location and computational systems can understand you, but how we can create a landscape that uh, you can move freely in three-dimensional space and then the, the environment can sense your presence and it responds accordingly. Uh, so this was another project that I was working on um, uh, in which um, it was as a collaboration with uh, a steel case company, which is a furniture company, and one of our lab in USC, uh, Mobile and Environmental Media Lab, in which um, uh, the, the idea behind this project was to create a reciprocal relationship between human bodily movement and the movements of the, the architectural spaces. So the ceiling is equipped with a Kinect motion capture camera that it can read your movements, the number of people and type of movements underneath the ceiling, and based on uh, those type of information, the shape and the type of the movement in the ceiling, it reflects on that. So it was kind of interesting. We had like exhibition, people came in and, and they interact with the piece, which was kind of interesting to observe. But this journey for me um, really didn't just uh, stop in architectural scales because um, I realized that a lot of time these sensory technologies, including Kinect or, or different sensors, it can also be sort of applying on the surface of human body. So it can be not so far from human body, but sort of apply or populate around the human body. I got really inspired by the work of uh, some people like uh, cognitive scientists such as Andy Clark 
and the notion that we are already natural born cyborgs because of the relationship that we have with our devices. So it's sort of our relationship or human relationship with technology is something which is already inevitable. It's already, uh, we're carrying so much technology already on a daily basis. Um, so I started thinking more about uh, how we can apply these, these technologies to human body. Um, I used, um, also I co-edited an issue of uh, 3D printed body architecture, um, which is the AD issue on, on um, which came out last November, and in which we just focused on featuring architects who are not just working in sort of conventional architecture discipline, but they're uh, basically working in a variety of applications from human body scales or for the human body or in the scale of human body, including furnitures, uh, but using the, the, the um, digital technology such as 3D printing. Um, uh, so um, in my own work, I also started doing this type of work with uh, use of 3D printing, of course, um, uh, and how basically we can design objects for or around human body. This is um, Synapse. Um, Synapse is a um, multi-material 3D printed helmet. Um, I think it's, can we dim the light down a little bit? Um, just because it's really dark. Um, um, so, um, Synapse is um, equipped with um, two uh, basically EEG sensors or, or brain sensors that it can capture your attention level, meditation level, many, many information from your brain. Basically, your brain generates certain frequency when you do different type of activities. So um, the helmet is equipped with this EEG technology and uh, the, the information related to uh, attention level is mapped to the movements of the helmet. So if you think more or your attention level goes higher, the helmet opens up, and as you think less, the helmet um, kind of cools down and creates uh, a cocoon around your head. So one of the um, idea behind this project was actually um, really thinking about uh, how, where is the boundaries of our biological body? Can we, if we, if we um, sort of interface uh, with external objects outside our body and we can control them with the power of our mind, can we claim that that object is part of our body? Um, so this sort of started from this idea that how we can really blur that boundary and can we live with this type of technologies and we treat those as part of our mm, biological body? Um, next project I want to share is uh, Caress of the Gaze, which was, I was an artist in residence in Pier 9 uh, in Autodesk, um, which was in San Francisco, it's a, it was amazing maker space, now the things are changing there, so, um, but uh, it's basically um, a 3D, multi-material 3D printed uh, cape, which is equipped with facial tracking camera, and um, it can uh, sense, of course, your presence. It can read your uh, age, gender, and basically where you're looking at. And based on where you're looking at, it moves um, accordingly. So I'm going to walk you through these projects uh, in terms of the design process behind this project. Um, uh, but uh, this design process is really similar in all the other projects that I also uh, worked on. Um, uh, the design process behind this project can be break down to three interconnected um, sort of activity um, that one inform another. One is how I designed the form, uh, second how I actuated or how I made it dynamic, and lastly how I designed an interaction or interactive system um, for this garment. So first, uh, in terms of um, form or how I generate the form, um, basically at the time I had, uh, in, because of this residency, I had access to uh, uh, the very advanced um, 3D printer machine um, that it can not only 
prints with uh, very, very high resolution, 16 micron uh, resolution, but also it can have variety of material properties. This means that computationally I could define which part of the material is hard, which part of the material is soft. So I started experimenting and creating series of prototypes studying auxetic structures in terms of their contraction and expansion and how we can sort of uh, differentiate, for instance, in this case, between soft and hard material. Uh, as you can see, the joint in between, which are black, are soft material, and the members, which are white, are hard, hard material. Uh, and what kind of contraction expansion you can achieve from, from, from this um, material. But soon after, when I started printing, designing these things and printing them, I realized that the material, wherever you have a discrete uh, connection between soft and hard material, they're very easy to break. Um, however, in nature, there are many examples of materials that um, they're one continuous surface um, that it consists of many, many material properties all uh, have a sort of very interesting transition from one to another. Um, so I think fish scales or lizard's skin system uh, was very interesting. At the time, I was reading um, this science paper on um, uh, fish scales. Uh, what is interesting is that fish scales are very hard material, but because they're located on semi-flexible mesh system, it enables the entire body of the fish to bend and, and, and moves in certain direction. That's why you see the flexibility of the, the fish. So that was really interesting. So I, I started kind of implementing the same type of um, both formal expression as well as material behaviors uh, in these prototypes. Um, so uh, from here onwards, it was kind of a journey to produce uh, various uh, materials, uh, studying how we can sort of computationally uh, have different material composition of soft to hard material in order to generate different type of material behavior. Uh, so I started making a lot of these prototypes, testing their behaviors, um, and in a month and a half, I almost had like a full libraries of these uh, small uh, material samples, uh, which was really fun to produce and, and, and uh, play around with. This is showing the actual final print of the piece um, with 11 different material properties. Um, it took about 50 hours. Um, so what is interesting for some of you that less familiar with this technology, so there is no assembly process on this. It's just hard and soft material. It just uh, produced in one run. And you just take it out of the, 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 the bed of the machine. Uh, second was actuation, how I made these things dynamic. Um, so in this case, I, I, I use variety of actuation system, but in this case, I use SMA or shape memory alloy. Shape memory alloy, um, it's a type of metal that it contracts when, um, when you heat it up, or it's temperature actuated um, uh, muscle wire. They're also known as muscle wire because um, the, the, the way that they move is very organic. Um, so I started kind of placing this material in various prototypes and studied their form transformation. Um, and uh, kind of, I had libraries of these materials with different thicknesses, different current. So I used electricity, and because this is a conductive material, when you heat it, when you let the electricity go through the, the wire, it basically heats it up, and then therefore it, it contracts. Um, this material is both very, very fascinating and very frustrating to work with. It's fascinating because it's soft, it doesn't make any noise, it doesn't make any jerky movements like conventional servos or motors. Uh, uh, it's very frustrating and a lot of engineers don't like to work with this material because the material changes its resistance when it's uh, actuated. It's very difficult to control. Anyway, I, I was collaborating with a, um, a dear friend of mine, a mechanical engineer, to come up, to, to come up with some uh, uh, interesting way to overcome some of these technical difficulties. Um, so this is kind of showing one of the first prototypes that uh, how this material kind of caused the whole garment to contract. 
Uh, just for those of you who are interested in uh, a little bit uh, why I'm saying this is a complicated uh, actuation system, is that a lot of time um, SMA actuators, the heating and the cooling time is not equal. In other words, you heat it up, it contracts very fast, but it takes a really long time to, to relax itself. So it's not an equal heating cooling um, um, behavior. Um, so the last section was the interaction. Uh, so this uh, garment is equipped with a very small camera. The lens is smaller than three millimeter. Um, so you hardly even notice that there is a camera there. And the camera can read about your age, gender, and where you're looking at. Uh, the, basically reading the yaw and pitch value that is coming from onlooker's eye. Um, and um, send that information to a microcontroller, and microcontroller control the behavior of the garment. Uh, and uh, just to go back, there is um, eight actuations are underneath the garment. So the, everywhere you look, basically, the start moves based on the direction that you're looking at. Um, so pitch and yaw are the values that it re read from the eye of the onlooker and then mapped to the actuation system underneath the garment. But conceptually, um, I think the, ish the, the notion of gaze is the interesting one because, uh, I mean, we often uh, communicate so much just by looking at one another. A lot of time uh, we are in public domain and we don't notice that someone is looking at us and all of a sudden you look back and you notice someone's gaze on your body. So if we already sense or have the sense of the gaze of somebody else on our body. So for me it was very interesting that how um, technology can enable us in a very literal way, in a haptic way, uh, to sort of feel the gaze of someone else on your body. Um, and of course, um, this was the interesting one because the projects got um, viral and it's got a lot of views, a lot of various responses, either good or bad, positive or negative, which was, for me as a designer, was fascinating. I knew that I sort of tap into something quite sensitive culturally. I think the issue of male gaze on female body, it has a really a long uh, cultural uh, historical baggage into it. So I was, uh, um, uh, it was very interesting to just observe that how people would, would react to it. Um, so this is the video that we made initially. So as an onlooker, um, as a wearer, you notice which part of your body is being watched um, uh, because it has a specific, it has eight actuators underneath, uh, so you get the haptic uh, response in your body. Uh, as an onlooker, you're noticing that your action being notified, so you kind of it probably ward off any further actions. Uh, so it would sort of like rewiring a little bit of like social dynamics and social interaction. And that was one of the interests in this project. I want to just um, step back again and uh, I talk, to walk you through this process of material development in this last project. So the last two projects, both the helmet and the, the cape, was using a very advanced uh, material uh, systems using... Uh, uh, using um, uh, 3D printing, a uh, multi-material 3D printing, which is a very, very advanced machine, um, to in order to create a very specific dynamic behavior. So part of my uh, practice, I'm just looking at how we can use a um, variety of digital fabrication technology, including this very advanced 3D printing to in order to produce these this material systems. Uh, but Having access to this machine, this is machine is uh, like quarter million dollar machine. It's very expensive to produce such a thing. So I was just lucky to be the residents in this company. But um, for me, what they started with this question that how we can actually use um, 
cheaper, more accessible 3D printing technology and do the type of uh, the work that I was doing before. So I was working uh, with another machine that it was able to just print one material uh, similar to SLA or SLS, uh, very, very fragile. Uh, but we find out that if we um, look at geometry as a way of controlling material behavior, we can design uh, dynamic behaviors. So uh, what was interesting in this process was we print something very small, we bend it a little bit and it just break. Um, but we wanted to make something like a, a, a dynamic uh, top uh, that it just changes its shape. So it was the question that how we can develop this type of system. We find out that if we print um, a very, uh, we print in a form of a spiral or a coil, um, even if you use a very brutal, uh, fragile material, uh, it's it's very easy to produce a resilient, flexible material. So this becomes the principle for generating. Um, just around the notion of spirals, generate series of formal expressions of what this can look like. Um, this lead to uh, a series of projects, uh, which um, I'm not going to show all of them, but one of them was uh, Body Escape. Um, Body Escape was looking at using SLA 3D printing, which is a very, very fragile 3D printing, but understanding that how we can use these uh, ideas on the human body. Uh, so in this case, I was looking at, um, I wish I had this image, but I don't have it. We, I used, um, how many fashion students we have here? Perfect, okay. So uh, maybe you guys know about Langer lines. Langer lines are uh, lines that basically um, uh, surgeons use uh, when they do operations uh, because they're minimum tension lines of the skin. And those, uh, basically, they're showing that uh, they don't move as much as the other parts of the body. So basically, if we map any design based on, to map based on those information from the human body that I'm sure a lot of fashion students would, would start their, their designs from there, uh, it's very interesting because um, in this case, I was using the material that wasn't able to flex, wasn't able to move so much. So if I could map it to the lines that it's minimum tension line or minimum uh, movements of the human body, therefore I could have been uh, basically using this material as well. Um, and so the whole idea behind this project was to understand the human body as a departure point, as a landscape for populating this form, but also to celebrate um, human uh, body movements. Um, so this piece um, uh, is also equipped with uh, a very small sensor, a small gyroscope that is located on the shoulder of the wearer and based on, on her movement, um, basically it maps to the, to the lighting pattern of the garment. So as she moves her shoulder in certain directions, uh, you see the pattern of light is also changing. If she moves really fast, therefore the, the, the whole entire garment starts to kind of uh, uh, have uh, the rain effects. Uh, so it was really to kind of synchronize the movements of the human body and um, the behavior of the garments. But also, to some extent, the material itself was able to, to flex and move with the human body. sensor technology, as you notice in all these other works, um, so including either gyroscopes or EEG sensor reading from your brain activity and information that it can be captured from, from your brain. So I'm really interested to variety of sensors, including um, computer visions or cameras that it can read your age, gender, facial expressions, and all that information, I think there's so much um, just from reading uh, physiological responses. So these sensory technologies for me are sort of um, excuse to just uh, find out more about um, the, the emotional states of, of people um, or some information related to, to, to users or, or wearers. 
So for some time now, I've been wondering, can computers or machine have emotions or not? Um, obviously not. Um, but at least these type of systems, including sensors and, and actuation, robotic systems can enable them to create the illusion or simulate the illusion that they're having some sort of emotional uh, responses. Um, so um, the next two projects that I want to share is really kind of tapping into um, this idea of emotional or affective computing. Uh, I've been really fascinated. Uh, this is the notion that came from computer science, um, looking at can computers can have emotion and can we simulate an emotion in computers? I think for us as creative people, it's also very important to not just um, think about AI as something that just uh, help us in a quantitative way to just help us to, to have a better systems, but how it can help us to interface with human emotion. Um, and that's what I am very interested in, in this type of work. Um, so in this project, um, uh, actually, um, it was the first project I decided to not do 3D printing. I was um, uh, a little bit frustrated uh, to some extent. Uh, usually cost of 3D printing is really high. Um, uh, it's just a different workflow, and I decided this time to use a completely different kind of hands-on experience of making something with my hand. Uh, so this is this is a soft robotic um, dress uh, that it can um, respond to the emotions of the people around. Um, if you look at a lot of animals uh, and a lot of different mammals, uh, including mice, cats, dogs, they have these responses to their emotional information. When they get intimidated or they get excited, their hair kind of bristles out and, and they, 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 their, their fears kind of stick up. Uh, so that was really interesting for me. Um, so then the question would be, is it possible for our garment or for our dress to sort of work as a second skin, to work as almost a sort of a fair for a human, to respond to those most subtle aspects of our uh, social interaction, which is emotional states of people around. Um, and we express um, a lot of time our emotions through mo various modalities of our body, including our facial expressions, our hand movement, our bodily movement. We already express so much to the outside world um, through these mediums. But what if our garment also can sort of serve as a medium for, for expressions of, of emotions? Uh, just to give you a little bit background of uh, where, um, like, can we actually have some sort of universal emotion um, that uh, we can detect? Um, so this is some of the studies that uh, Paul Ekman, uh, who is a psychologist based in UC Berkeley, uh, that uh, he ran to really, he questioned that is, is emotion universal or not? Or is there such a thing as universal emotion? So he basically argued that there is six type of basic emotions that it doesn't matter where you go, uh, even in really primary uh, tribes, they have this type of emotion. So if there is such a thing as in universal emotions, then our computing systems um, or computer vision should be able to detect these emotions and tell us that what kind of emotional states are people at. So um, Similarly, we used a system that uh, can detect uh, five basic emotions, sadness, happiness, surprise, anger, and uh, neutral, um, uh, to, to detect what is the emotion of the persons around. Uh, this dress is equipped with a very small, similar to caress of the gaze, it's uh, equipped with a very small camera, and the camera is able to detect the, the, this, these emotions of the people around. Um, so if we can detect the emotion, the next question is how the garment would respond to different emotions. So in other words, if my dress can understand the mood of this space is happiness or the mood of this room is anger, how my dress can respond to that? So the question of mapping emotion to motion is the interesting one. Um, in, my, in my research, I'm quite fascinated still with this. Um, there, from 60s, there were a series of experiments uh, has been done, uh, including this one uh, on the right hand, the, the, uh, the, in which these scientists, they were trying to understand that can we assign um, different type of emotions to something completely abstract, 
these are just series of triangles and a, and a circle, yet when they show these experiments to people, people not only assign different uh, emotional um, uh, characteristics to each of these elements, but they also tell a narrative that, oh, there is these things happening here. So um, uh, that is very fascinating. Similarly, on the left-hand side, um, what you see is um, uh, uh, they were trying to really, um, by just rewiring uh, the system of um, motor and the sensing of a very simple robot, they come up with interesting way that define the characteristics of that robot. So the robot can be called a lover or explorer, uh, just based on just changing a very simple principle of how you wire the, the sensing and the actuations. Anyway, these two examples was very interesting that how we can actually map um, what kind of movements um, we can correlate to what kind of emotions. Uh, what is the type of um, happy movement versus aggre aggressive movements. So a lot of my research was looking at that. I think people in animation for a long time I studied that, that how what kind of movements can generate different type of um, uh, characteristics. Um, I think I, I, I'm yet learning about this, these principles, um, and it's certainly a challenging one, uh, especially in non-figurative ways, because if you're having a human face, it's really easy to, 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 to assign certain characteristics. But then when you're working in the fashion scales, in, in something which is completely a garment, then to map emotion to, to movement is not, um, certainly not an easy task. Um, uh, so I used... Um, Variety of um, uh, robotic system in, in this case, um, very small solenoids uh, that they can control the air um, and how the air basically popping into the to the garment. This is a very dark here. It's it's a shame, but there is really uh, this is the process of fabrication of this garment, which you might find it interesting because there's a very tiny, small. It's a it's an acrylic sheet that it's laser cut with a very small, tiny holes. Um, and it's about uh, 52,000 fiber optics uh, hand placed uh, one by one. So it was a really labor intensive project. I had a series of students coming in and going and really make help to make this project. Um, and then eventually uh, the entire uh, fibers basically went to the bath of silicon. Um, and then after the silicon cured, we took the, the sheet of acrylic out. Um, on the second image, um, here you see uh, the inflatable pockets, uh, so two on the shoulder, two on the breast, and two on the hips that basically start kind of deforming the garments based on uh, the emotional information. So one thing about this video is that um, we didn't want, uh, and it was a little bit of a creative decision, that we didn't want to have a second character, but there are multiple second characters in the scene that we don't see, so we just see one character. Uh, but the reality is that the emotion is basically captured from the people uh, around. After these projects, um, I sort of uh, got approached by um, Adidas, uh, I got commissioned from Adidas to um, produce a work uh, for showcasing their concept shoe that it's supposed to come out in 2020. Um, and um, the idea really was to really engage with the notion of affective and emotional computing and how we can um, generate uh, a sort of a new type of engagement for the viewers. 
so um, really uh, looking at um, uh, the same type of systems, how we can read about the viewers' um, responses, and based on that, how we can amplify these excitements. And the reality is that a lot of time when, um, so this is actually showing the piece, and you, you can see the shoe inside. Uh, there is a very small camera which is located here, um, and that can read uh, the sort of emotional responses of the viewers. Mm -hmm. Um, this is us kind of testing the system. Um, so our system not only can detect various emotions, but it can we can even train it to have user recognition. So it can understand on Benaz and that's Julian, which is pretty incredible. Uh, but the question that it was interesting for us is, uh, so when you go and you see something very new, most of the time if you're really excited about or you're really surprised, most of the time your response is that you're smiling or you're looking by some sort of... <gasps> What is that? So that moment. So we wanted to sort of see how we can amplify this excitement or happiness of the viewers that see some innovation for the first time and we amplify it. Uh, so the whole idea for this piece was, uh, so if, the pers if there's no face, uh, we look at this piece as a character. Uh, we see that this piece is a sleeping. If there is no face, uh, that the piece is in the sleeping mode. So there is the lighting maybe doesn't have any special effects or it's like a dreamy mode. And then as the person is detected, um, then it goes through different scenarios. So um, almost um, similar to how perhaps in animation people design characters. So this piece has an eye, the eye can see you. And if it's, it, it recognizes that you don't have any emotion, um, it's just basically just the moments that it recognizes your face, it just generates a ripple of lights. The moments you're happy, the shoe inside they start to rotate around and it generates like a red uh, flashing light that, oh, I'm happy too. And um, if you're uh, surprised, it also like, because most of the time if you're surprised, your mouth opens. And so the idea is also it generates sort of red ripple of light that in a breeze-like effect goes in and out. Um, so we'll see some, so this is actually in my um, studio, we were kind of like experimenting with, so when, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back and come back again. So when the face is detected, it just generates a red ripple of lights go back. And um, if you're happy, it's sort of like show that, oh, I'm happy too. And inside, we don't see in this perspective, inside the shoe is also um, kind of, when you're smiling, it starts to rotate um, in different directions. Um, so what was interesting um, is to how um, sort of designing customer experiences and how we can sort of apply this principle of effective computing to uh, designing novel type of uh, interactions. This is kind of diagram of showing what's happening inside. So inside uh, the piece, um, the piece is consists of 1200 uh, acrylic tubes. Uh, and inside you have the shoe, there is a camera, uh, and underneath, so the challenge uh, for me and my team was really how to pack everything uh, into this sphere. Uh, from microcontrollers, it has uh, four microcontrollers, one Raspberry Pi, two uh, power supplies, uh, many different components, just a stick, like they had to, we had to design the system so compact and so robust that um, to, to make sure that it's, it's gonna keep working. So this piece uh, then, uh, it get ready uh, and then shipped to Germany and now is in Adidas uh, headquarter. Um, this is kind of showing sort of a diagram of how the idea came about uh, for the fabrication. So every, like the whole sphere is, uh, consists of series of hexagon uh, and, and pentagon that they uh, milled uh, using five and three axis milling machine, and then using a series of screws and knots, basically assemble all these pieces together and, and put the entire piece together. But each of um, uh, the tubes have different angles. So that's why that you see those type of um, articulation in how the, the tubes are located around the object. This is the video.
project from the commission to us ship this project to Germany was seven and a half week. So it was insanely fast uh, project. Um, um, I also would like to mention that um, we did another a sort of a smaller exam uh, uh, experiments with Anna uh, in which we used lasers. So in this case, we had uh, LEDs kind of like beaming out to, to the um, to, to, to outside. Uh, but we also did some very small experiments in which we, we, will, we, will, we will share it very soon, which we use uh, laser beams to kind of shoot out laser through this sort of acrylic uh, landscape, which looks really beautiful too. Um, so we will share that very soon. Um, yeah, so to sort of wrap up, um, I think um, it's very exciting uh, period of time for all of us to be in both in terms of accessibility of all these things that we have available, including the various ways that we can work with sensors. Things are way cheaper, way more accessible, but also in the way that we can sort of use various type of digital technology, I would say we are. In, it, it is a special time that we can think, tinker with all these ideas, uh, which is not only um, coming from one discipline, which is just architecture, just design, just computer science, but it's somehow in between. Uh, so we are becoming this sort of um, interesting, maybe a little bit strange and weird, but in an interesting way, this sort of uh, creatures that we can fit into so many different disciplines. And I think this is a very, very exciting uh, opportunities for all of us to, to really think about, like think outside our own, our own discipline and just borrow things from other disciplines and come up with interesting ways, different application, different uh, ideas uh, that uh, it's not so conventional. And lastly, um, currently I'm, I'm uh, working on a big commission uh, from a science museum uh, and uh, certainly would appreciate um, looking for interns and we're hiring. So if any of you guys are interested, please send me your email, uh, so your portfolio. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.